As the Spirit of Christ has led previous generations in the church, so the Spirit continues to lead this generation. And may the light of the Christ guide and inspire generations yet to come. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. And their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and their spirituality. And we are gathered on the lands represented by the Robinson-Huron Treaty 61 of 1850, the traditional territory of the Serpent River and Mississaugi people. And we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. And may we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. Give ear, O people, to God's teachings, for in parable and story, God's wisdom is revealed. Come, let us remember the stories of our ancestors in faith. Let us share them with our children and celebrate the goodness that has come from them. And God has established decrees with our grandparents and all generations. And God has asked us to teach and continue them. Come, people of God, let us raise our hope in God and remember our blessings. Let us never forget God's glorious works in our lives. Come, let us worship. Let us pray. Holy leader, we are presented once again with many choices. Today we have chosen to worship together in thanksgiving and praise. We have found the freedom and joy of being able to gather in peace. We have found the time and resources to be able to enjoy this precious opportunity. And we have followed the calling of our faith to come together in prayer and gratitude. Be with us as we worship and help us to choose you over and over again. Help us to recommit ourselves to the blessings and challenges of our devotion to you and your love. Be made known to us and help us to feel you near, we pray. Amen. And we pray a prayer of confession. Abiding God, there have been times when we have chosen the gods of our contexts over full devotion to you. We have worshipped at the altars of progress efficiency, competition, and acquisition. We have claimed to be your people while behaving in ways that do not bear this out. We have allowed the obsessions of the world and the scarcity mentality of our cultures to permeate our spirits and cause us to wander. We imagine we are ready to be in your presence but in truth are often asleep to the true preparedness of constant vigilance in your grace. Forgive our shallow ways and wake us up to what it means to be ready to follow wholeheartedly. Jostle us into alert commitment. Teach us to embrace the responsibilities that come with helping to bring about your realm on earth and help us to stay awake and be prepared, we pray. Amen. The great good news is that though we may sleep and fall short, God is always awake to our needs and provides overflowingly. Though we may wander into the wildernesses of temptations, God's journey is one of focused and complete compassion. We are loved and we are forgiven. God's will always embrace us, whether we are ready for such grace or not. In this, let us be assured.
Our first reading this morning is from the, taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 to 3a, and then 14 to 25. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, and the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. In verse 14 starting, Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great things in your sight. And he protected us all along the way that we went, and among all the people through whom we had passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. And therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions of your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No! we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. 
And he said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statues and ordinances for them at Shechem. Our second reading is from Psalm 78, verses 1 to 7. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And finally, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 113. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, and all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And may God add God's blessing to the reading of God's word. Later this week, people all across the land will honor the soldiers who have given their life in the fight for freedom and justice. And so it's an opportunity to remember soldiers and our connection to them. Above the table where the offering plates are is a banner which I had bought years ago but finally got finished this fall. And it shows poppies and then it shows some petals sort of going off into the sunset. And the designer said that those poppy petals provided a place where one could write the names of Canadian soldiers whom one wished to remember. And so there are six names which I have written there. In two, September 2006, there were two young soldiers gave their lives in Afghanistan, and I believe it was the same um, event. One was Glenn Arnold of Macaro. He's the brother of the dentist here, Dr. Wayne Arnold. And the other was David Byers. He was 22 of Espanola, over whose funeral I presided. When I meet his dad, John, in the streets of Espanola, we simply hug. There's no words necessary. The third name is Pierre Chassé, who was of Deep River, who died in an accident, leaving behind a very beloved wife and three young lads that were under four, and the youngest was six months. My daughter, Sina, was eight days old when I held her in my arms 
in a Protestant chapel in Base Petawawa and gave a eulogy in honor of Pierre. Pierre was very special to us in the United Church in Chalk River. He sang in the choir and he had prepared to become a member at that church. The fourth and fifth names are twin brothers, Charles and Alexander MacDonald. They are Winston's uncles. Charles lost his life on a troop train accident in Elmont in 1942. It was a train wreck. And Uncle Alex served in rebuilding roads and bridges across Europe, going as far as the Hartz Mountains in Germany. He had a work crew of 35 prisoners of, wars, of war, and daily he feared for his life. His experiences in Europe marked him for life, and he became a very deeply troubled alcoholic. And if one mentioned the war, his face became gray, and it was as if a veil just dropped over his face. And I was privileged to be with him at his hospital bedside when he went to eternity. The sixth name is Leslie McQuestion of Chalk River. He was a cousin of Winston's who died overseas in the Second World War. And his sweetheart was named Margaret Cook, and she was of my first pastoral charge. Every November the 11th, she comes to the cenotaph in Chalk River and stands remembering. And she never married until late in her 70s. What struck me when I came here to Holy Trinity is that there is no plaque hanging on the wall with a list of soldiers' names who had died in service from this community. And those of us who have come to Elliott Lake come remembering the names of fallen soldiers in the communities from which we have come. And whatever the underlying reason, our soldiers have made a choice to sign up and serve their country. And those soldiers who have served and returned home injured or suffering from PTSD are sometimes honored with a quilt of valor. And our Elliott Lake Quilt Guild has members bu busy making quilts to be given to soldiers whose names have been brought forward to be honored in such a way. And it's a way of acknowledging the sacrifices that they have made. Soldiers have chosen to serve. And in so doing, they have helped to ensure that there are future generations who can live in freedom. The Old Testament reading that Kathy read, Joshua exhorts the people to make a choice. And he gathers all the tribes of Israel and he speaks to them. And he reminds them of what God has done throughout history for them as a people. And he exhorts them to put away the gods that their ancestors had served in foreign lands and to choose God, to choose Yahweh, the Lord God, and to worship him and to serve him. And Joshua says, now revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And the people responded that indeed that they would serve the Lord, the God who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, who had done great signs in their sight. Indeed, they would serve the Lord. And Joshua challenged them. They could not worship the Lord God and foreign gods. They had to put away the foreign gods for the Lord God was a jealous God. And so Joshua tells them that they are witnesses before each other that they have chosen to worship the Lord God. And again, he encourages them, incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And so the people respond, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. And so Joshua then makes a covenant with the people of that day and he made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote those words in the book of the law of God. God wants our undivided allegiance. So in the numerous daily choices that we make in life, how do we put God first? How do we honor God? How do we make the choice to honor God with our time? Do we choose to show up for worship on a Sunday, whether in person or through online worship now? Do we choose to nurture our spirituality through reading scripture or praying or meditating? How do we honor God with our talent? Do we offer our God-given voice to sing in a choir? 
Do we offer our hands to serve, offering our skills as an electrician or a carpenter or a plumber? Do we offer our hands to serve, offering our skills as a cook or a baker or a gardener or a needleworker? Do we offer our hands to serve, offering leadership skills or organizational skills or administrative skills so that the work of the church might flow? And what about our treasure? How do we put God first in our decision making about our money and our investments? Money has to flow, like currency needs to flow like a current in the water. Sometimes as a minister, I have to make difficult choices and I can recall having to make one of those. Having to pull rank, so to speak, and make a decision about and how an event was going to proceed. And I had to overrule the leadership of that group that had that event. The event proceeded smoothly, otherwise it wouldn't have. However, that choice had a negative impact upon a relationship. And I look back and faced with a similar situation, I would make the same choice. Sometimes a choice comes with a cost. Then there's the church's choice to be nice. Sometimes the appropriate word or action is not taken because we feel we have to be nice. And matters can then sometimes be complicated. Sometimes the right choice is not to be nice, but to be firm and graciously truthful. Sometimes the gospel of nice can hold us back from real growth. However, there are choices that are always appropriate. There is always the choice to love to love and welcome the stranger, to welcome and tho love those who might be on the fringes, those who are difficult to love, and to love those who do not love us, and to love those who are other than us. And in so doing, our lives will be transformed. There's always a choice to be prepared. The gospel story of the 10 bridesmaids, five foolish and five wise, is a story about preparedness, about faith in action. And one resource makes the comment that it is a sorting story. In Jewish tradition, lamp oil is a metaphor for righteousness or good deeds. And so the bridesmaids are sorted. Five are prepared to do good deeds to act righteously. And five are not prepared, so there is no faith in action to be manifest. So, is the, so there is the choice to be prepared to act in faith, to shine one's light. Also suggested by the gospel story is the choice to include or exclude. We can make choices in the church to hold meetings during the daytime, for this means that seniors don't have to venture out in the evening, especially when it's dark or in clement weather. But that choice means that anyone who works during the day cannot take part. They are excluded. So choices that might enable one group of people to come out might exclude another group. Choices are not always easy. There can be war between countries, yet there may be warring individuals or groups or families or in communities. And that makes me think of another choice that is always appropriate, the choice to forgive. For it is through forgiveness that we can move again to, toward a more healthy relationship. Forgiveness is a powerful action. And so daily we are faced with numerous, numerous choices. And I hope that we can make choices that lead to life, to love, to light. Faith-filled choices, faithful choices. Can we make choices that will care for successive generations? At yesterday's Canadian Shield Regional Council annual general meeting, it's a long, big thing, we had the opportunity to talk with one another courtesy of our Zoom technology when it worked. Friday night, Roger and I got very frustrated because it didn't work. Anyways, yesterday it worked pretty good. In one breakout room, we shared how God is calling us to a particular mission. And as I reflect, all of these are about caring for the next generation. People had a passion for mission in enabling care for people's mental health which is most often difficult in most more northerly remote regions as the people resources simply are not there. There's no psychotherapist 
in the Sioux. A passion for feeding the hungry. A passion for working towards safe running water for indigenous people. A passion for working towards inclusion and safe space for LGBTQ peoples. Decisions, choices that we of this generation make will pave the way for justice for succeeding generations. As we are living through this pandemic, we are faced with choices. Choices to reduce the risk of catching COVID-19. Choices like wearing a mask and sanitizing one's hands. Choices like sitting six feet apart, limiting one's exposure to other people and other places, or a choice to have a staycation. One of the downsides of physical distancing is the negative impact it is having upon people's emotional, mental, and spiritual health. So maybe, for the sake of those we love, and for the sake of those most vulnerable, maybe we just have to make a choice to take a risk. The morning after the American presidential election, I woke up early around five o'clock and laid there wondering, should I get up and turn on the TV to find out more? But I chose to keep laying there for a while. And some thoughts ran through my mind, and it was like, what if Trump got in again? That would mean probably several more years of COVID-19 running rampant. It would mean more years of a closed border. It would mean I wouldn't be able to see my dear friend in Erie, and she wouldn't be able to see her mom and stepdad in Loveland, Ohio. What would be the impact upon university students studying online, hunkering down alone? Or what would be the impact upon high school students with limited opportunity for social activity? How will this pandemic and its COVID-19 risk reduction choices impact this generation of young people now growing up? And only time will tell. And what might be the risks, the choices we make as a community of faith, as people in this community, for the sake of the well-being of future generations? And ultimately, it is up to us as individuals to be responsible, to make our own choices, that there may be life abundant and well-being. May we not fear, may we choose not to fear, and guided by the Spirit, may we be enabled to choose well. Thanks be to God. Amen. We for the dead let tears and silence tell of blood and
how to spend our money and our time, choosing how to use our talents and share our skills are choices we regularly make. So may we make wise choices and offer to God in our various ways our best. Let us pray. Today, more than most, we ask you to hear our prayer of dedication. We dedicate ourselves again to you. We are ready to be in your presence and to be your people. Receive our worship and our promises as evidence of our commitments and love. Receive these our offerings of money and bless them all, we pray. Amen. Go from this time and place. Choose to minimize risk and choose to take a risk that others might have life abundant. Choose to share your faith that others might have hope. And now may the God who loves us deeply and steadfastly hold and protect your heart. Amen.